Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. So, everybody got the homework down? Okay. So, after the class, please hand it in and we can put a pile here and a pile there and put your name there for sure. Okay. Great. So, what are we going to do today? <laughs> well, that's not, not the physics class. <laughs> but we're going to have some fun for sure. So we're going to have today talk about the persistence lens, continue to discuss the persistence lens in conjugate polymer and how do we understand this term and what effect it and what kind of model can persistence lens tell us about. So key to this particular um, concept are our textbook chapter 6.4. You're going to read, uh, read over that. And how many of you uh, have finished reading chapter 6.4? OK, I see almost a half. Good, good. How do you feel like chapter 6.4 so far? Understandable? Yes. I feel like it's so hard. Mm -hmm. Really? OK, good news. That's good for me. So 6.4 6 is especially covers um, persistence land and one like chain model. OK? So we're going to, for today's first half of the lecture, we're going to finish that. If we have a little bit of time, we're going to start to cover a little bit 6.5, which is radius of gyration and concepts about why we should measure and uh, discuss the radius gyration since we already know the end-to-end -end distance, right? We, need, we have one parameter, why we need a second. So in the, let's recap what we discussed in the last lecture. So we talked about several key concepts in, in, um, in statistic of conjugate, uh, in polymers, not necessarily conjugate, right? In general, in conjugate pol in polymers, when those polymers are not behave as free joint chain, we need to consider uh, expansion factor. And we discussed the, the concept about characteristic ratio. So you guys certainly need to learn what this particular term is, C infinity. Second, what we also talked about in last lecture is about what we have talked about B, called st statistical. segment lens, OK? So this term tells you what is equivalent in a free joint chain, how long your statistic segment lens would be. And one of the homework is actually related to that. We also discussed a little bit about um, what it would be the equivalent free joint chain model. So if you consider in the real chain, you always has end-to-end -end distance, h square will be equals to c infinity and l square, right? Number of bonds, this would be segment length. Equivalently, you can describe this by m b square, which is uh, equivalent free join chain, has give you similar, or, or should I say exactly the same end-to-end -end distance. And at the end of the lecture, we talked uh, some of the concept about LP, persistence lens. So before we talk about equations, et cetera, let's discuss the physics. What does persistence lens tell you for a given polymer? If you open the textbook, there's a table actually list all the B, <coughs> LP, C infinity, and what is your, you know, impression about this parameter? The length that goes before it makes a change in direction. The lens for the chains to take before it change direction, and can you be a little bit specific by defining change direction? By 90 degree, roughly, right? So this is uh, like the physical picture. You can imagine what the persistence lens would tell you. 
So if you recall the number um, persistent lens for various polymer, polystyrene, polyethylene, they usually uh, on the order of a little bit less than one nanometer. If you go to the textbook, you will be able to look up the exact number. So what that means is for a regular polymer chain, if you use a persistent lens divided by your bond lens, that means it won't take more than five carbon-carbon bonds before it turns 90 degree roughly, right? So let me just to give a render drawing. So this is sort of some sort of example of what is persistence lens would tell you. Something are hard to see. Let me replicate the same drawing here. Takes about one, two, three, four, five bounds until it's fully rotated out of the original direction. But this is just a one snapshot. In the real model, it's can take the average of the chain. Okay? So a classical example people trying to give is a garden hose. How does relate to uh, relate to the concept of persistence lens to understand your chain's flexibility? Sonia, please. Uh, can you repeat it again? I didn't fully get it. Um, I guess I'm thinking about how something that's longer, it's easier to manipulate than if it's really short. It's harder to get it to do that full mm -hmm. 90 degree turn. Right, right. So that is related to what we're going to talk about um, in terms of persistence lens. How do we interpret the persistence lens to some real, real physical meaning? Like what? Sonia suggested is if you have a persistence lens of a given number, let's give it an arbitrary number, 10 or 5 nanometer, and your flexibility of your material or bond or polymer gonna be need to be described under the context what is the value with relatively to persistence lens. So let's say if you in this case, if you look at a garden hose, if you buy these old versions, so we actually got a newer one which expands, but they are more flexible anyway. <laughs> so in this case, it typically is about one feet. That's a lens. You still feel that it's relatively rigid. But on the order of one inch or two, it's basically very rigid. And if you look at the whole garden hose lens, it can rotate back and forth multiple times, otherwise you cannot wind it up, given the size scale about 50, 60 yards in that range, right? So the take home message for this case is the persistence lens should be compared to the contour lens to discuss if your chain can be winded back, okay? So for a rigid chain, as long as long enough, it still can turn 90 degree, right? But compare different polymer, it still have physical meanings by saying, I have a persistence lens of one nanometer, the other has 10 nanometer. Because this is, I call it a rigidity factor. So if it's higher, your chain is more rigid. Okay? Got it? <coughs> so now we talked about the physical meaning. Now let's get into the some mathematics. How do we get the persistence lens based on our physical model? We talk about several different chain models and how how can we understand it in terms of persistence lens? Can anyone help me? What is the definition of persistence lens? LP would be defined as average LI. So L is the bond lens multiplied by the first bond. Could be first bond or could be any bonds in this particular. What this physical meaning is in terms of this particular equation?
So this is L, this is L1, this is L. L is defined as unit bond length, okay? So what does unit bond length mean is how long a single bond length is. So everybody is pretty familiar with what dot product means, right? Dot product means um, if you take these two, because L is a constant, we can actually pull the L out because it doesn't contribute to the average. Average L is always L equals to 1. So you can write, let me unify my writing as L. First bond direction multiplied by R. So this will be equals to L. The length <laughs> of first bond, which should be L, right? And multiply by R. Then R is a little bit complicated. R need to be break down into individual bonds, so which is given by this particular equation, we know R is have individual component of Li. And each individual component is basically segments of the bond. So if I sort of draw here, four different segments, and draw first one in this direction. So I need to understand persistence lens. I need to understand what is the directionality of my whole polymer chain in the L1 point to the direction. OK? Is it pretty straightforward, right? So now the difficulty is actually when we expand this Li, which can has individual components of L1 all the way to Ln, what you would get is now an expanded equation. We pretty much know what is first component, right? L1 dot L1 will be L squared. How about L1 dot L2? Depend on the bond model, right? So how about we start with discussing the Free rotation chain, free joint chain. Sorry. So this will be zero. Zero, 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 always zero. So the persistence lens LP for free joint chain gonna be L, right? So <coughs> it kind of makes physical sense. It just take one bond for the free joint chain to have the bond to rotate 90 degree, because it can go any direction. You don't have much control. Yes? Can you please define um, L sub 1 again? L sub 1? Yeah. L sub 1 is first bond in your chain model. Okay. The direction of where the so first bond. So it will, it's basically a vector okay. from the origin to where the end of first bond is. OK, L2 will be the second one. Okay, thank you. So we basically are trying to get where from first bond. How about free rotation chain? Ah, that's why where it makes things tricky. What? Any volunteer? Can you speak up a bit? Yes, that's for free rotation chain, right? So this will be the same. Yes. But how about L1 dot L2? Right? It will be L square cosine theta, right? Because the product means what's the neighboring. And bond one, bond two, each has a length about L. And the angle between them is theta. How about this one now? L squared cosine theta. 
So L1 dot L3, you now get going to be L square cosine and theta square. Why? You have you have two, you can think about as two times projection. So you have first bond and second bond and third bond. Each would have a cosine and theta components project to where the previous bond. So in general, we can basically wrote Li, Lj, any bonds in the, in the polymer segment and any j, it would be i minus j and take an absolute. So which means, <coughs> which means no matter how far you have two segments, you can calculate how much the dot product between these two. i can be first, j can be any of them, OK? All right, now let's move on to the next slide. Pretty much what we have been discussed, OK? Where we talk about what is LJ, Li dot Lj will be equals to. And any question for this particular part? No question? All good? But it still haven't solved our problem, where is let me go back. Still haven't solved this particular problem. Now we have many components along the polymer backbone. How can we treat the data to get what we needed? Say it again. Right. Um, but you kind of point a, a broader direction, but we need to feel a little detail what's going on for this individual one. But in the slides, I didn't actually add the there. However, this part is kind of um, have a little bit of mathematic tricks for you to understand how actually you would link persistence lens to what the end 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 to end distance is. So if you read the textbook 6.4, what um, Barge has discussed is how they can mathematically treat this particular equations to link it to persistence lens. Okay, so let's take a look how actually we we can make that being feasible. In that case, we will actually understand what, what this value is, right? Let's use first the method to talk about. Is basically, you would e always equals to LP going to be L1 is the first one will be L square. L square cosine theta plus L square Sine theta squared. And you're going to all the way add up to cosine um, L squared cosine n component, right? It's just adding each component together. Yes, Sonia? What's in between the 1 over L and the L squared? What's between? Uh, wha for what you just drew, there's a 1 over L. The uh, word a princess. Yes. This would be directly tell you what the value would be. So this actually will be you can you can take out all the common component which is mm -hmm. L. Well, yeah, it's, it doesn't matter <laughs> because when n approaches infinity, n or m minus 1 or m plus 1, 
all going to be the same. It's just for the simplicity we just write it is. So this would be equals to, you can take common component L square L, right? And multiply by 1 divided by L. Well, this sh should be L1 plus cosine theta plus cosine theta square. all the way to cosine n theta. OK, how, how do we resolve this problem? Hmm? Yeah. OK, the same, right? And anybody have a suggestion what this very long component would be equals to what this pretty long component one plus cosine theta plus cosine theta square plus all the way going on. Oh, I see. So anyone? One plus alpha upon one minus alpha. One plus cosine. Alpha is theta, right? Is this really the no. one? No. One plus, it's effectively L upon one minus cos theta. I it, think. It try, try it again. It's one plus, mm -hmm. one is separate. And plus cos theta upon one minus cos theta. Mm. Like this? Yes. Because so summation of cos theta from so basically summation of alpha from one to n is alpha upon one minus alpha. One I think it it w it's it should be L multiply one minus cosine theta n. Yeah. Because multiply by alpha. Right? And I'll explain why why you actually would get this component. A little bit complicated, but it, it's quite easy to understand um, from points of mathematics. So we can we can actually try to think of this as a, a series of number. So let me see. The border is a little bit small. Let me use here. It's it's basically it asks you what is one plus cosine theta one plus cosine theta square. Or you can simplify as as an example one plus x plus x square plus If you're doing mass major, it's quite easy to understand. When n equals infinity. And how do we get there? It's, it's better to understand reversely. By saying reversely, I mean, if you understand 1 minus xn would be equals to this component multiplied by this, right? Yeah. yeah. So you can understand the problem reversely. In this case, we have A equals to B divided by C. It's better to understand what is, if this makes sense, B equals to A multiplied by C. OK? In this case, this is A component, which is a very long sentence. This is a B component, which is a 1 minus x. If you multiply this multiply by this, this will be the answer, right? Because 1 multiplied by this component, you would have the same equation. How about minus x 
multiplied by the top, you would get first component minus x multiplied by 1 would be minus x. Minus x multiplied by x would be minus x squared. Right? If you combine these two, those all cancel out each other. Anything in between except 1 minus xn, which is exactly the same as this, because when n approaches infinity, it doesn't make a difference. So this would be one of the ways you can get the persistence lens for your conjugate, uh, for your <laughs> polymer. I'm doing too much conjugate polymer research. <laughs> Always saying conjugate polymer. <coughs> so this would be the generally how you would get in, in a free rotation chain. However, if you want to combine it with the backbone lens, you would, uh, you would get the persistence lens would be equals to c infinity and l square. And this was not uh, discussed now, and uh, I'll explain just in one second how do we get persistence lens relationship with characteristic ratio. Okay? Everybody has a problem so far with what we explain for free rotation chain. This is more like a general model for any polymer chain, how you would get consideration of each part. So again, I want to talk about physics for uh, physical meaning first then go into a little bit more <laughs> detailed equation discussion. So LP, in this particular equation, what you would get is now a relationship between LP and end-to-end -end distance. What you would get is, if you plug a gen generic equation for any uh, chain model, you would have c infinity and l square and divide by 2n l square you would get this uh, c infinity l divided by 2. Please, Sony. Is the 2 coming from the fact that we're comparing two lengths at once? No, I will explain in, in a second. 2 actually comes from how we treat the, how we combine the persistence lens with, mm -hmm. um, with uh, end-to-end -end distance model. So because end-to-end -end distance, we only consider half of the matrix. Mm -hmm. And in, the, in, the en in this particular end-to-end -end distance, we consider the full matrix, which we will discuss the mass in a second. But physically, what LP means is if we just uh, separate as C infinity multiplied by L, it's better for you guys to understand. What is C infinity. It measures how much expansion of your chain model compared to the free joint chain, right? We talk about C infinity, depending on different bond angles, C infinity would be equal to 2 or 3 or 4, right? So this is bond lens. L is basically what gives you the single carbon-carbon bond. So with this says, C infinity divided by 2 multiplied by L, it tells you C infinity basically is rigidity factor. They were talking about the same thing, but different ways you actually express them mathematically. C infinity is not a lens. It's, it's a lensless unit. It's just a number, 2 or 3 or 10. But now, if you know a single bond, which is 1.5 nanometer, let's say C infinity is 10, divided by 2, you got a 5, multiplied by a carbon-carbon bond is 5.5, you can get a persistence lens about 7.5 nanometer. Okay? So they were talking about the same physical parameter, but they express them differently, so they have different meaning. One is a lens scale. The other is a unitless uh, number tell you how much the chain expands. 
due to the rigidity along the polymer direction, right? So make sure everybody on the same page for these conceptually what the LP is. All right. Next step might make you guys even a little bit crazy or confused is people also define a LK, also known as cone lens. Okay. Cone lens is defined by twice of LP, which is more simple. It's just characteristic ratio multiplied by L. Okay. Any questions so far? <coughs> Anyone? Now is a good time to ask questions. I feel afternoon class is always very quiet. I need to bring a Starbucks coffee here <laughs> before we start the class. They have a coffee coffee break for five minutes before we start. So if not, yeah, Sonia, please. So what we talk about f so far is always ideal chain. Mm -hmm. So th regarding the question you ask, they don't make a difference. Cone lens is persistent. They were the exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just a f a not twice times different. So when you, they, they can be used almost interchangeably. Okay. So cone lens, persistent lens, etc. But one of the one of the benefit of using this is now you're going to have a third way of describe the end-to-end -end distance. We know we have infinity and L square. This we have been teaching as day one. We know we have equivalent free joint chain model. Now <laughs> we have a third way to define LC multiplied by LK. But there it Speaking about the same thing, what is the LC? Contour lens, which is equal to n multiplied by L. What is cone lens? C infinity L. So if you combine this, it's it's basically the same, but depend on different textbook, you would have different meanings. Okay. So. Everybody clear about how does different free uh, models affect your C infinity factor and affect your rigidity of your chain or persistence of your chain? So coming from free joint chain model, we have any question? How we get the first relationship. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. That's actually a little bit boring, so I, I'll try to keep it in the later part because <laughs> a lot of mess. <laughs> if I talk 30 minutes of mass transformation, equation expansion, everybody goes probably asleep. I should bring sleep back then coffees. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about physical meaning first, then go into some mass. Uh, where, w where are we at? I was talking about how these actually were talking about the same thing. And when you consider three different chain models, free joint chain, it will give you a persistence lens, basically L. C infinity is also one, right? So when you consider free rotation chain, we discussed C infinity will be one plus cosine theta, one minus cosine theta, right? So that is basically how we relate this infinity value. And if you look at the persistence lens, now you can see LP is also equals to one half So depending on different angle, you would uh, introduce different rigidity along polymer chain. So if you rotation angle, 
is theta. Let me define what theta because we have previous case we don't know. Theta is a minor angle, okay? So use this angle if your theta is smaller. You can see your C infinity will increase. We talked about in last class when theta equals to 60 degree, we would have C infinity of 3. When theta is 10 degree, your C infinity is crazy high, maybe 50 or 60. Now you can understand why this matters because if theta is 3, all the bond is fixed to going forward, right? Everybody gets it? If, if the theta is 60 degree, let me give two examples. Let me get a razor. When theta is when theta is equal to, let's say, 60 degree, okay? So you would have a bond, then this would be 60 degree, right? The next bond will be rotating around this cone for 60 degree again. It's a little bit ugly, but you guys got the point. So if it's 60 degree, then LP would be equals to half of 1 plus cosine 60 and 1 minus cosine 60. Multiply by one single bond is 1.5. Then you can get this is about uh, 3. So you have a persistence length for about 2.25 Armstrong. Now, if you change the theta to be 30 degree, your persistence lens will be increased because now this is fixed at 30 instead of 60. And next bond, it will be also 30 going along this cone. And what you would get is now half. 1 sine cosine 30, 1 minus cosine 30. OK? And cosine 30 is uh, 2 uh, root 3 divided by 2. So I wouldn't use the number here, but it will be higher than the top. Now let's, let's get a crazy case. What if this is a, a only a 5 degree? Five degree will make your chains almost straight, right? The next bond will be also very straight because each bond angle is fixed to five degree. So you're going to have a very long persistence lens. Can someone help me get a five degree value so that we know what it would be the exact? What is cosine phi? It will be 0 0.5 degree, are you sure? No, it should be somewhere close to 1. 0 0.9. 0 0.9, OK, good. Let's assume it's 0 0.9. So now, if you, if you do the math, will be roughly, let's see, this will be 9.5 multiplied by 1.5. It will be, yeah, let's say 14 angstrom. OK, this is the effect of 7 more rigid because of we reduce the angle between the different bonds. And it also makes sense because it takes much more bond to rotate, potentially rotate this 5 degree bond angle swing by 90 degrees. OK? And cone lens is basically twice of persistent lens. So cone lens basically 
tells you when your chain would be turned back to where opposite direction where the chain is trying to go. Okay, everybody happy with the uh, persistence lens? Understood, right? So if you want to consider hinder rotation chain just uh, another factor if you multiply by the dihedral angle, okay? It's one, cosine, one plus cosine phi divided by one minus cosine phi. Yes? For this example of mm -hmm. this model, can you still do, make the assumption that it's using the um, major angle? Mm -hmm. um, and you would just split the fraction to have one minus cosine theta on top? Yeah, yeah. In the last yeah, 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 the same, same. It's just uh, because cosine theta and phi is exactly opposite. Okay, thank you. Right? Okay, so we covered persistence lens and um, the persistence lens and the cone lens. So now we're going to talk about something a bit more complicated. So before that, uh, we should take a break. So when we come back, we will cover how we get the C infinity. Then we talk about a little bit more complicated one chain like model. But one like model is basically say, what if your chain is not super rigid and is not flexible? What if it's in between? Can we have a better model than the previous model we talked about? So one chain model is with consideration of persistence lens and contour lens, how these two varies and affect your end-to-end -end distance. But in this case, you know your R and N R square or end-to-end -end distance is no longer dependent on as traditionally we would have as number of bonds and L square. But it's actually built in here. This is a contour lens, so this is effective is N L um, square, right? N N multiplied by L. This is uh, C infinity divided by two multiplied by L. And this is a little bit more complicated because we have now exponent there, exp. That can be a little bit tricky. OK, let's take a five minutes break, then we come back. Yes. Is it necessary to understand? I mean, you gave us some pretty rotating, rotating mm -hmm. persistent length times. You gave us this equation. Yeah. Which is essentially um, the length times the um, summation approximation of that. Right. Right. Uh, it's a it's a different way. It's actually it looks different with that. Yeah. So this is this does look different than that. Yeah, it is. Okay, that's what I thought. It is. They're well, not exactly the same. Preference for which? No, you, you stick with the, the one up there, because yeah. this is a more generic way, because it covers not only um, free rotation chain model, but it also hinder rotation chain model. So okay. it's more generic, because then when you, you just need to know theta and phi, and then you can do everything from that. Right, right. All right, uh, that's my only question. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> 
say that again? Yeah. So we're on the one like chain. Yeah, position is I'll finish it and I'll finish the one like chain today as well. Okay. Because okay. I like this because concepts first. Make sure. Okay, we are good for second session. So we're going to start explaining how persistence length for generally uh, ideal chains get to this. We know that LP will be equals to L1 dot R. Okay. Or this can be written as I. Or this will be equals to I equals one to N L L one. Any question for this part? It's basically repeat what is the sum of individual component for our Resistance lens, L i multiplied by L one multiplied by L i. So the textbook sh actually showed as a trick of doing this mathematic simplification is instead of consider this is i, you don't need to necessarily project it from the first chain. It can be any bond along your polymer. It will give you essentially the same answer. Okay, so if that is the case, we can basically more generalize this equation to j equals to x l x l j. It's basically the same. When you have x is equals to one, you simplify this to particular this equation. So this is a more generic way we express what's a persistence lens. And what this now help you to understand is now, if you consider this only considers dot product in one direction when j is from x to n, right? So how does this, this would be inspire you think along what's n to n distance square? What the n to n distance in that particular case? If you recall, They look very similar, except there are some differences, right? 
So the largest textbook showed us one of the trick to go into that is basically now first the step is now consider this as looking at the other direction of your persistence lens. So in that way, you can first uh, simplify this combined from j equals 1 to n. So what this does is now you consider if you multiply LP twice from left as well as right, you can generalize this to be a mathematical treatment so that allow you to consider the bond persistence lens in both, uh, you know, looking at the equation in both directions. That means we count not only from x to n, but from 1 to x. And then plus 1 to n, we can get the full consideration of your uh, sum of this Lx multiplied by Lj. Okay? So how does that result the difference? So you will have twice of Lp, 2 multiplied by Lp, twice, 2 multiplied by LP result L divided by half there is one part we actually happen to be counted twice which is the Lx multiplied by Lj twice. So we would uh, leave just a single L at the end. Okay? But eventually this doesn't matter, as you will see. When L is infinitely large, this component is, is useless or minimized. Right? So because this you have L I j equals 1 to n, from L I L J, and this will make it doesn't matter what this L is. So if L is just a by itself, eventually it will be dropped off. We can do it either way. Okay. So now we need to do one more trick. Is this only differs by A sum of it by itself by n times. If you look at what this does, is it only counts what the j is, but then counts what i is for this particular equation. So what we need to do is basically do it one more time. However, divide by n, multiply by n. So this equals out to be one. Right? Then multiply by j equals to 1 and Lj, Lj plus L. Everybody gets it? So that was just the same as the prior equation, but you multiply by 1 over n times n. Yes, and you will see why I do it in a second. Okay. In the next step, I'm going to erase this n, but you should write it one more time. But now this is j equals to 1 to n, because you just uh, convert the n, because n terms can be basically the same as this, and you add it n times, it's equal to n. Each individual component is the same. So we basically convert the n to you add the same component n times. Makes sense, right? So with that, now you can see this particular component is basically um, c infinity, or what we call it, n to n distance. So what you would have is h squared now plus a single l. Yeah. Okay, cool. Then this would be i equals 1. Yeah. 
So that's basically converted to uh, end to end distant definition. Lena? So this is uh, h square, end to end distance. Here? This is i. But there's a parenthesis after 1 over l. At the very beginning of the equation. At the very beginning of the equation. Oh, this is l. l. Yeah, and then there's a, is there? This is n. In between, 